So it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this last keynote uh, session at the, at the um, conference, which also is the last act activity. So we have two great speakers, uh, Alexander Fadjan and uh, Neil Lee, and Neil Lee goes first. Uh, Neil is an associate professor at London School of Economics in, in Economic Geography, and he also holds a PhD in Economic Geography. His research has focused on cities, economic change, and the social dimension of innovation. He's particularly interested in the links between innovation and inequality, a topic I believe he also will deal with in his lecture on the inclusive regional innovation policy. So, Neil, the floor is yours. Uh, we will very look, much looking forward to it. And you have 30 minutes at your disposal. And I will warn you, five, two, zero, okay? Wonderful. So, happy Brexit day, everyone. <laughs> uh, so, look, I need to start off by saying thank you to a few people. First of all, thank you, Guy, everyone, for staying here um, for this session, not exploring the delights of the Canning Museum or um, the other things Stavanger has to offer. Um, I want to say thank you to the organizers for putting on a fantastic event. Um, I think we have all really enjoyed Norwegian hospitality. And looking out there, I can see a few people have enjoyed maybe slightly too much Norwegian <laughs> hospitality last night. Um, and I also want to say thank you to the Norwegians, who are our only ally now um, out of <laughs> Europe, for giving me something to think about which wasn't the, um, the imminent collapse of my national economy. Because um, it's Brexit Day. So what I'm going to be talking about is policy. And I'm going to be talking about, you know, what I'm going to be doing is, is building on a sort of strand of research on policy, which I've been doing for about, well, almost going back to my PhD. Because like many of you guys, I started off, well, I do a lot of policy-focused research. So I work a lot with civil servants, people in think tanks, and so on. And I did a couple of pieces of research, one of which was with the Resolution Foundation, who are a, a sort of top-level UK think tank. And afterwards, I got invited into government a lot. And what they wanted to talk about was the idea of how they could make regional or local economic development policy focused around innovation, how they could make it inclusive. And I think this is quite interesting, because they all kept, I kept coming in and people kept saying, so tell us, tell us, Neil, inclusive innovation. And I had no answers for them. I had nothing but sort of critique and a little bit of an evidence base. And so this paper is an attempt to sort of try and move on and actually say something um, a little bit about this inclusive innovation agenda, and which comes in the UK, really is the sort of culmination of several different... So you have, I'm pining for my homeland, um, so you have to excuse, if, excuse me if a little bit of this is very UK-focused, but the reason this is important in the UK is because we have a series of agendas which are all sort of aligned on this sort of central point. And the first of these is the inclusive growth agenda. So we've seen some very significant uh, reports about the idea of inclusive growth. Basically, this draws on the idea that over the last 30 years or so, we've had economic growth, but it hasn't always benefited people. So particularly, we had this big wage squeeze in the period from 2005 you know, up until relatively recently, where real wages for large groups of the population really didn't increase. So you saw these problems of sort of inequality which were addressed through, this concern, well, addressed through this notion of inclusive growth. The second thing which has happened is that there has been a more interventionist approach to the government. So this is or to economic development. So even under the last government, or was it the last government before that, we had this notion of industrial strategy. People started to intervene in a very un-British way in the economy. And this industrial strategy agenda, a lot of it was localised. So local areas, places like Oxford, Cambridge, London, all focused on creating local industrial strategies. And a number of these local industrial strategies have focused on the idea or tried to, sort of, tried to have a, a sort of inclusive element to them. And there's this third agenda, which is um, this guy, the evil genius of Brexit, Dominic Cummings, who's much more focused. You know, so this is a guy who was a special advisor to the government, and he basically masterminded the Brexit vote. Um, but he's also got a sort of second side to him, which is that he's a very influential policy advisor now, and he's very focused on spreading out science and innovation across the country in a way which will be equitable. 
He's very interested in this sort of equitable distribution. And so what we've seen was this sort of wave of people who were interested in the idea that somehow we could have local industrial strategy, which were local innovation strategy, which would be inclusive, which would somehow bring people into the process of innovation. Now, the problem, of course, is that we don't know how to do it. So we sort of see efforts like this. So this is Belfast City Council. They have launched an innovation and inclusive growth commission. And really, this piece of work, my first motivation is a desire so that when these policymakers come to me and they say, oh, so we're doing something around inclusive innovation, Neil. Uh, what do you think of that? And so my first rationale is really to have something to say about that. But my second rationale is, I guess, um, a little bit more sort of personal, and it builds on some of the sort of foundational, uh, foundational facts uh, which we all know about the geography of innovation, which is that innovation, you know, while we focus on the new and the novel and the interesting, actually, one of the things which innovation does is it leads to inequality between places. So here's a good example here. So Cheshire in the northwest of England. It's a, you know, it's a very nice place. It has per capita R&D spending roughly of the level of Denmark, and it is almost as rich on a per capita base as Sweden. So you have a sort of relatively rich part of the UK, does a lot of innovation. But places like West Wales and the Valleys, where we have much lower levels of R&D spending, much closer to that of Greece, these are much poorer. So these are places which are almost as rich as Malta, so a smaller, less affluent country. And we kind of know this sort of fact. We're all sort of, um, you know, we're all kind of used to this. I like this example because we have a north-south divide in the UK, which is true, but we tend to describe very, very, um, very, very imprecisely. And I like this because Cheshire, which is in the northwest, this is a northern place which is rich. And we tend to assume that everywhere in the north is a sort of barren wasteland, which is nonsense. So I'm using this example partly to, to reflect that. So we know that innovation leads to inequality between places. We know that there is a difference between, you know, if you have a successful innovation strategy, you know, it, it can help your local economy. But we also, and, and research is increasingly focused on the idea that innovation can lead to inequality within places. So this is my favorite example. It's an excuse to get um, the, wor uh, the word fuck into a conference presentation. <laughs> um, hopefully live, liven you up a little bit. Um, this is from, of course, Silicon Valley, the most extreme example we have. People protesting the Google bus. People saying, actually, you know, while we have this, you know, th this world envied leading in innovation economy, it is not inclusive. And so I'm judging people who take photos of this slide, I should say. <laughs> but uh, people, even in this place, this place we would regard as like the forefront of innovation, the place which is the most important center of innovation, there are still concerns about inequality, poverty, and disadvantage. And this concern goes back to the sort of early contributions on Silicon Valley. Annalise Saxenian in the 1980s was writing about the bifurcated labor market of Silicon Valley, where you had predominantly immigrants in service work, and then you had essentially rich people doing, making semiconductors um, in the sort of high-tech sector. So Silicon Valley is an extreme example. Another extreme example is, and which is much more personal to me, is my hometown of Oxford. So this is... Um, People protesting in Oxford, we are much more polite than the people in Silicon Valley. <laughs> but this is people protesting in Oxford, make Oxfordshire affordable. And essentially, when my parents bought a house in Oxford in the 1980s, my mother was a social worker. And these people are actually, lots of them are social workers. Because the problem is, we have, in a place like Oxford, we have this highly innovative economy. We've seen innovation, you know, everything sort of is innovative and shiny and new, well, and sort of lots of the firms are new, and we've seen this extremely important success story. But at the same time, I look back to the people I went to school with and the people who didn't go to university, the people who aren't taking part of this, in this sort of um, you know, innovation economy, and actually, you know, I have to question the extent to which things have been made better for them. Because nowadays, I, you know, when I go into town in Oxford, I see people I used to go to school with or play rugby with or whatever, and, you know, they tend to live miles out of Oxford city centre because house prices are so high, and they tend to be doing sort of low-wage service jobs. And even 20 years ago, they might have been able to find uh, employment in, you know, making precision instruments at Oxford Instruments, but lots of that has been automated. Lots of that has been... Lots of those good middle-class, well, middle-class non-graduate jobs have gone. 
So we have this problem even in places like Oxford. So these are these two relatively extreme examples. Now, I did my PhD on this sort of stuff. And at the time, there was, you know, I was, felt like I was kind of not quite alone, but there weren't that many people researching these issues. There weren't lots of people doing research on innovation and inequality, certainly in subnational areas. But actually, there's a lot more now. And one of the gratifying things about certainly the last 10 years has been seeing some sort of big hitters weigh in and do some sort of significant research in this area. People like uh, Maria Savona, Tom Kemeny, um, uh, Andres Rodriguez Pose, uh, Richard Florida, if I'm allowed to say that. Um, all of these people who are doing research in this area and looking at, do you gain from the sort of, do, do people gain from an, an economic development strategy focused on high tech or R&D or patenting? Because, you know, one of the things which we know is that innovation is important. There's no economic development strategy which doesn't involve innovation in some form. You know, we can't go without it. But what we've not been very good at is managing the sort of consequences, managing the things which go alongside um, innovation in terms of higher living costs and the time, fact that some of the jobs which are created in these high-tech economies, these are not good jobs. It used to be that my friends in Oxford, they would go and work in, a, in the Oxford car plant. Now, pretty much, they will be working, um, washing up in the city's restaurants, that sort of thing. And we know alongside this, there was a you know, great keynote on um, a couple of days ago about the problems of inclusion within the innovative activities themselves. So about the problems of gender inclusion in STEM. And these are also significant issues. And actually for some people, not for, you know, while on average there is a positive, you know, we all gain, or there's a positive average effect from innovation on the economy, for some people they lose out. And we're not very good at sort of managing that transition. So this is what I guess we would call the inclusive innovation agenda in the UK. So people are increasingly interested in the notion of inclusive innovation, how we can make innovations, well, innovation-rich economies. Now, this is kind of old, you know? There's been a lot of work on um, inclusive innovation, the concept in the global south. But what I'm particularly interested in is how it has sort of transferred over, first of all, to a national economy. So there's a really nice piece of work by Nesta where they look at all of the um, innovation strategies for, I think, 10 countries, and they find that all of them have some sort of social, social goals alongside the sort of growth goals of innovation. And my concern really is that, you know, this idea of inclusive innovation is becoming a sort of buzzword, and we need to really think critically and carefully about what it is which is happening, and particularly what's, f what's happening on the ground in economic development strategies. Because there's lots of good research out there, people putting together good frameworks, as I'll talk about in a moment. I'm not concerned with the goals, I'm not concerned with the wider frameworks, I'm concerned with the application, what is, absolute, what is actually happening on the ground. So, let me motivate this a little bit more. This is the idea of inclusive innovation, and we're talking, you know, I'm just gonna give you some couple of graphs, just these graphs are going up. That shows you that the topic I'm talking about is more important. This is the, or increasingly important. We have this is Google Trends. Google Trends, you can see that it sort of became an important concept in the late 2000s, and there's been, you know, it's got sort of steadier and slightly more important since. It's not a new concept, the idea of inclusive innovation, but it's sort of changing and it's morphing, as these concepts do. Um, as an academic, of course, I'm interested in how many um, publications there are referencing inclusive innovation. You know, right back in the early 2000s, very little, but this sort of explosion in the end of the 2000s, start of the 2010s. You know, lots of publications in this area, most of them focused on the global south, and I think it's always interesting when we are um, taking concepts in the global south and trying to reapply them in um, what political economists call advanced democracies. And actually now, you know, so the first thing we did as part of this project was we, of course, read the relevant literatures. And we're lucky because there's a lot of nice work going on in this area. You know, work on inclusive growth, loads of research in this topic on management studies, innovation studies, development studies. And I just need to say one thing here, which is that I'm excluding, we're excluding at this stage, work on responsible research and innovation. And that's for two reasons. One is because uh, Rundal Fitchar has a really nice paper on it. Um, and we don't want to sort of cover that material. But the second reason is that it's a European Union concept and Brexit. Um, 
If we talk to, if we talk to politicians about that, they're not going to be too interested, sadly, with the current, sort of, the current climate. So there is a lot of literature on this. So what I'm going to do is sort of try and sort of problematize this a little bit. I'm going to start off again with being a little Englander with a reference to one of the best of our cultural exports, which some of you will know, which is called The Thick of It. And The Thick of It follows a conservative cabinet minister, um, and he really struggles to grapple with the most basic things. And, you know, this is basically the sign of you know, how things are changing and old, old uh, middle-aged white men in the Thames Valley, like me, are being left behind by, um, by society. And he basically struggles to guess what the term inclusivity is. He can't get his, he can't get his head around it. But we're lucky, because actually there are some quite good definitions of inclusive innovation. So from the management literature, people talk about inclusive innovation as being about innovation that benefits the disenfranchised. The OECD have a very nice study from 2015. Innovation projects are initiatives that directly serve the welfare of lower income and excluded groups. And then Nesta more recently have this slightly bigger definition. But you can see how this is starting to get fuzzier already, right? Because these are not definitions which are necessarily sort of applied to cities. So let's look at some examples of what is happening. So there's a really nice strategy for Washington, D.C. In D.C. under uh, Mayor Bowser, they, and they, you know, going back to 2016, they had an inclusive innovation strategy. And the aim was threefold, and I think this is a you know, nice piece of policy. First of all, they wanted to you know, grow the number of tech firms, which are with, well, grow the number of tech jobs which, with, with um, disadvantaged groups working in them. Second of all, they wanted to allow disadvantaged groups to set up as tech entrepreneurs um, if they could, or make that easier. And third of all, they wanted a sort of culture change within the tech industry. They wanted a culture change to sort of try and address these problems which they face. Um, so that's a nice example. Another example, Innovate North Carolina, sort of public-private partnership. Belfast City Council, I've already given you this. Um, the London um, Local Industrial Strategy, this is the, you know, people approached me about that, that was why I first got interested in this. Uh, I know people here are working on it. Um, I'm going to go into this example in a bit more detail. So this is Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh, their strategy illustrates, I think, some of the problems, some of the issues with this inclusive innovation agenda as applied to cities. So they have six points. First of all, they want to address the digital divide. They want to empower city to citizen engagement. They want to provide open data to Pittsburgh. They want to improve internal operations and the capacity of the city, advance the clean tech sector, and promote the little local business environment. So you guys are tired, so I thought I'd use emoticons to illustrate my opinion on each of these. Um, and the emoticons didn't, the shrug emoticon didn't work, um, so I've used question marks. But some of these, it seems to me like they really do fit very nicely in an inclusive, uh, inclusive innovation strategy. Addressing the digital divide seems absolutely an important thing to do. Empowering city to citizen engagement. There's some stuff in there which is a little bit funny, you know, things about improving the city's website. Um, providing open data to Pittsburgh and then you start to get into this sort of smart cities territory. And the concept sort of starts off relatively focused, and then once it meets the realities of local government, the realities of what actually a city like Pittsburgh can do, things start to get a bit more difficult, because you know, you're in smart cities territory where we know there are huge ethical concerns. Improving internal operations and capacity of the city. One of the things they suggest doing in this is um, uh, smart tech rubbish bins. So, you know, if you, you know, if you have a bin which is full somewhere in central Pittsburgh, it will have a sensor in it. Um, now, that's a good thing to do. You know, no one likes overflowing rubbish bins, but I don't know if it's quite in the spirit of a sort of inclusive innovation. Advancing the clean tech sector, I like that. And then promoting the local business environment, you know, this is a good thing to do as well. Does it involve, does it, should it form part of some sort of inclusive innovation strategy? I'm not so sure. And I think there's a hint here, right? You know, this is not a bad strategy, but one of the things they suggest right at the end is that they want to brand Pittsburgh an inclusive innovation city. And there's always a concern that when you have something like inclusive innovation, something which sounds good, that it is going to be used as a sort of branding exercise rather than a genuine attempt to change policy. So here's my sort of constructive critique. First thing we, which is obvious is that inclusive innovation is a fuzzy concept. 
we started off researching one thing, next thing we know we're looking at something very different. Now, you know, my, this is a Rorschach test. A Rorschach test is um, what you go, if you go to a psychologist, apparently they show you a Rorschach test and you will project onto it something which is in your subconscious. So I see the pint I am going to have in that bar <laughs> in about an hour. Um, and I can also see the hole in my wallet that that is going to cause. Um, you might see something else. Um, but the point with inclusive innovation is that you, know, you have this concept, and you know, I'm, I'm not trying to critique, there, there are some really nice ways of defining inclusive innovation. Um, and the sort of policy literature actually on it is, I think, quite good. But um, when it gets applied in real, when it meets reality, it becomes rather fuzzy. And you can't really see this. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a PowerPoint or a, a sort of uh, PowerPoint issue. But this is from Anne Markusen, where she talks about fuzzy concepts. And Anne Markusen says that fuzzy concepts are problematic because researchers may think they're addressing the same phenomenon, but may actually be targeting completely different ones. So what we've done is we have gone through a load of inclusive innovation strategies, and we have tried to work out what people mean by inclusive innovation. So this is the foundational you know, foundational concepts around inclusive innovation, what we thought it meant right at the start of this project. Inclusive innovations, as in the sort of Tata Nano, a sort of innovation designed to serve disadvantaged groups. Second thing which we thought, you know, which is clear in these strategies, is this idea that you need to think about inclusivity and who innovates. You know, measures to address the lack of diversity in tech, you know, I, I'm absolutely not having a go at those. I think those are incredibly important. Inclusive decision-making for innovation. You know, how do you choose the priorities for where, um, where innovation happens? Which parts of the economy you invest your R&D budget or you know, create your Fraunhofer's or whatever it is? We have this other point, which I think is interesting as well, which is in innovation in inclusive sectors. You know, do you try and shift innovate, innovative activity away from sectors where advantaged people work to sectors where disadvantaged people work? in a way of improving productivity and hopefully improving standards in those sectors. And this is quite a common theme of these strategies. This other one I think is probably more common and more sort of, uh, I guess, common with us, which is the idea that you have innovation for inclusive growth. You basically innovate somewhere and you assume that the benefits of that will sort of trickle down to the disadvantage in that city. And, you know, there will probably be some benefits, but there will also be some costs. We also see in the UK, there's a, in the Northeast um, Local Enterprise Partnerships putting a load of money into inclusive innovation, by which they mean um, innovation in public services which benefits disadvantaged people. So this sort of additional meaning. And then, of course, there are also measures around dealing somehow with the consequences of innovation. All this stuff is you know, super important. Um, and I don't mean to say that any of this is sort of you know, bad policy in any way. What I'm just questioning is where the extent to which it all sort of fits together as a solid po sort of policy framework. But perhaps the strength of the concept actually lies in this sort of fuzziness. Because, you know, one of the things we've seen is that it allows people of different political persuasions to sort of come together to focus on a shared sort of idea. You know, inclusive innovation sounds good. Innovation sounds good. We're all here at a Geography of Innovation conference. It kind of sounds you know, future leading, aren't we innovators and doing important innovative things? Inclusion, of course, sounds good. Put them together and you have a concept which people can back. And you have a concept which people can back who are, you know, often from quite different political persuasions. But the problem, of course, is that as we know from the development literature, these fuzzy concepts are often dropped. You know, we start off with a concept which, you know, if it starts to sound which has, you know, got some sort of solid meaning, some nice definition behind it, and then after a while, you sort of st things start to become a little bit less clear when it me makes contact with reality, and eventually it becomes sort of relatively useless. And actually, there's some really good examples in the development literature of concepts which were sort of used, became very, very important, and then were sort of quietly dropped. So my next critique, so it's a fuzzy concept. That's my first sort of problem with these strategies. My next critique is really, it's really two critiques, but it's this notion that it is sort of solutionism. Poverty, disadvantage, these are things which are difficult to tackle. They are uh, difficult social, political, economic issues. And there is a challenge here that you know, inclusive innovation sometimes blurs into the idea of uh, some form of solutionism. So rather than try and deal with these in the tough way through you know, redistribution, culture change, things like that, 
what you do instead is you say, right, what we're going to do is we're going to you know, have some sort of technological fix. So you know, Morozov's got a really nice book where he talks about the idea of technological solutionism, and this is a, a sort of problem there. But there's a really nice paper, um, and in fact, Tom Scott Smith has a book out. It's this guy, Tom Scott Smith at Oxford. He has a uh, really nice book coming out where he looks at the problem of neophilia in humanitarianism. And he basically documents the fact that every time some new technological solution comes along, then the aid agencies go crazy for it. And he focuses on nutrition. So one stage, people are eating you know, the sort of food you eat in space, and they're trying to give that to people in refugee camps, and so on, and so on, and so on. And basically, you know, his critique is that we are always searching for the next solution. And actually, some of the economic development strategies or the inclusive innovation strategies I've seen, they definitely have an element of this going on. Now, the next problem is scale. So we talk a good game about inclusive innovation at a local level, and the cities sort of say that they can sort of do some stuff. Thank you. But actually, you know, many of the most transformational, you know, it's entirely naive to expect the Welsh Valleys to come up with the next transformational technology. You know, we know that there is a, you know, for many places, development strategies are not going to be about creating the new innovation, no matter how, uh, or creating the new inclusive innovation. Actually, you know, that's always going to be created somewhere which is at the leading edge. And my argument here is instead you need to focus often on the diffusion of innovation, because it's the diffusion of innovation which really matters. So my fourth critique uh, I've chosen to illustrate with one of my um, five-year-old daughter's toys. Um, and this is a Chinese robot unicorn. So remember that, Chinese robot unicorn. And I like this. <laughs> this Chinese robot unicorn for me says quite a lot about economic development policy, because it illustrates the China shock, because uh, it's come from China. It illustrates technological change, because it's a robot. And it illustrates the fact that we often make promises in economic development which we cannot fulfill, because it's a unicorn. So, you know, unicorns don't exist. So politicians often promise unicorns, but we sort of deliver donkeys. Uh, or they, they deliver donkeys. Uh, and actually, you know, I think we need to be sort of, you know, and, and my point here is that we, in lots of these inclusive innovation strategies. You can do it at a national level, but at a local level, places are sort of buffeted by the forces of technological change. They are buffeted by these sort of um, big global forces. And I guess my concern is that if we focus on inclusive innovation at the local level, we are letting national government, which has most of the big sticks, off the hook to a certain degree. So what I've done is I've critiqued inclusive innovation so far. And what I don't want to do is leave you with the impression that actually inclusive innovation is a sort of you know, a sort of a, a rubbish concept which is, you know, completely distracting attention. Because I don't. I actually think there, are, there is quite a lot of merit in these strategies. And this is a follow-up paper I did to a paper on inclusive growth. The paper I did on inclusive growth, it was sort of a sympathetic critique, but actually there was a lot of not... Uh, it was more critique than it was sympathy. Um, and a lot of the inclusive innovation stuff is actually, you know, not so bad. It's pretty good. So I want to sort of finish off with the case for inclusive innovation. Why should we be thinking more carefully about this? And why should we be thinking about it? Now, first of all, you know, I, start, I motivated this with the example of West Wales and Oxford or Chester. And actually, you know, we all know that the, you know, if the solutions, if the problems are local, then often the solutions will be local as well. And, you know, uh, Josephine Rickards did a very nice presentation, apparently she made this point yesterday. And the second point I want to make here is that actually one of the things, certainly in the UK, which is sort of holding back this agenda, is the perception that we need to only be investing in the best science or the best innovation. We only need to invest in the frontier. And I think that's wrong. And I think we need to do a bit of that, but I think we should be valuing growth in places like West Wales more than we should be valuing growth somewhere like Oxford. And I think we need to accept that sort of, you know, maybe it will cost slightly more to have a bit more growth in Wales, and that's the right thing to do. And some forms of inclusive innovation, you know, clearly, you know, I'm absolutely not critiquing these in any form, because they are not just, you know, some of the things which have been wrapped up in the inclusive innovation agenda, these are things which are absolutely, you know, we just have an ethical um, reason to do. So I'm going to skip through the type of policies you do in inclusive innovation to sort of conclude, because, you know, basically, you know, my argument today is that, you know, there's a great session two days ago on the dark side of innovation. And I think that we really need to be considering the dark side of innovation in our research. 
We need to be thinking much more carefully about that and much more carefully about what cities and regions can do to try and facilitate these inclusive innovation policies because there's a big evidence base, but we are, on the whole, not contributing to certainly the sort of policy usefulness of that. But we need to be careful when we do so. We need to think about policy agendas which work for nations rather than subnational powers because you end up with these sort of skewed strategies like the one I showed you in uh, Pittsburgh. We need to be careful that the policy frameworks are often nascent and we need to keep it very closely in mind, this sort of problems of solutionism and neophilia. And inclusive innovation is important, but it can only go so far in solving these deep, entrenched social divides. So I just wanted to conclude with, because it is Brexit Day, um, and with apologies to the Norwegians, um, I just wanted to conclude by saying thank you very much. <laughs> um, that's my last public act as a European citizen. Um, Hope, hopefully you'll have me and us back sometime. Need for a very, very interesting talk. We have approximately 10 minutes for questions and comments. <laughs> if anybody can concentrate on that. This goes to the end. <laughs> so there's microphones there. Yes. Thank you, Neil. This was uh, very provocative. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, so you're critiquing inclusive innovation. Can you give us some um, suggestions of policies you do like? So I'll, I'll allow you to go back to the yeah. slide. So I do like it. And actually, um, you know, there are, there's some really good work in this area, right? Um, and um, so, you know, I, I have to mention your husband, Danny, has got some really clear-headed no-nonsense paper on this type of policy agenda, which is really good and clear-headed and sort of spells out the sort of different agendas in a really nice way. You can think a little bit about the sort of type of policy. I mean, I would think about inclusive innovation policy as thinking about the sort of strategic choices, inclusive production of innovation, and sort of downstream activities of innovation. So Danny's got this sort of, you know, consumption um, and production ideas, and it sort of builds a little bit on that. And there's lots which can be done, and there's lots which can be done at a city level. You know, I'm not too down on this concept. This is like a, I quite like this concept. I just think it's important that it's critiqued by, it's a friendly critique rather than a sort of critique from its sort of enemies. And I want something to be able to, you know, go to the government with and say, you know, you're doing it like that. Actually, I think that's a little bit problematic. You know, what, some of the thing, one of the things we've seen is this, um, you know, definite tendency towards solutionism. You know, some of, the, some of the strategies we've seen and some of the things which certainly civil servants in the UK have been talking to us about. You know, we can just solve this problem magically by having better broadband access in deprived areas. Um, and I think that's naive, and I think we should push back about, against it a little bit. Neil, thank you. Happy Brexit Day <laughs> thank you. to you. So that's great, uh, as usual. Um, I'd like to have your opinion or what kind of political weight you would put in, the, you mentioned somehow in, in the scale critique. I mean, innovation per se, like ensuring innovation, equality in innovation access versus ensuring equality in innovation outcomes, right? So if you want to foster innovation, you need to deal with some forms of inequality, uh, upstream inequality, because in, it, those who innovate are necessarily an elite or a, or a uh, it, it's based on, a, on a, an inequality of skills and so on, vis-a-vis -vis, um, trying to diffuse equally the outcomes of innovation. I think this is the real policy conundrum in a way. So what kind of weight would you put into sort of <laughs> value chain of innovation? Yeah, so, you so whether you would invest in getting more people from deprived groups involved in STEM versus if whether If it's a policy priority, because possibly including those people wouldn't foster innovation as much as uh, you would by including them. At the same time, the trade-off is to have less innovation to, to diffuse, if it makes sense. So, I mean, let me just begin by sort of talking about that trade-off, because actually I generally would believe that there is policies to get inclusive innovation policies, which get more people from diverse groups involved in innovation. I think those are pro-innovation policies, mm -hmm. and I think they would pay off. I think addressing the sort of structural barriers to participation in STEM sectors, you know, certainly as someone who's done lots of research on 
you know, the economic benefits of cultural or gender, di you know, gender diversity, all of this sort of stuff, it's hugely important. Actually, I'd sort of suggest that it sort of holds back these sectors, the fact that they are sort of, um, you know, so dominated by certain groups. So that's the sort of first point. In terms of policy priorities, I mean, look, I'm lucky that I'm not a policymaker. <laughs> and I, I, this has been recorded, I, but I am married to someone who works in the Treasury. And, you know, this point, so the Treasury is like the finance ministry of the UK. And she would make exactly this point. She would say, yeah, Neil, so, you know, it's not just a question of what you want to happen. It's a question of what you want to happen with our sort of set budget constraints. And I guess my answer would be that, you know, I, uh, you know, I guess my answer would be that you, you kind of have to prioritise a lot of this. And it's not the, you know, maybe there are things we do in terms of R&D investment, for example, in somewhere like Oxford, which maybe is just overheating. And we just accept that actually, you know, just funding the same places and the same sort of type of thing is maybe we have to cut back a little bit on that and make things a little bit more inclusive. Neil, many, many thanks for that really lively, iconoclastic presentation. But uh, I can't let you get away with what you said about the Welsh Valleys. <laughs> I, I so, saw you, I saw you as so, I said. So can, I, can, I, can I just say, seriously, when you said, you know, we can't expect a region like the Welsh Valleys to generate uh, a new breakthrough, some people would argue, for example, that the Welsh Valleys generated the model for the most significant inclusive innovation in the UK in the 20th century, namely the National Health Service. So I wonder whether you'd comment on that and think about you know, how, we, how we frame innovation and maybe we need more capacious ways to think about innovation. Thanks. So look, I, I stand corrected. That is a great point, right? So I chose the Welsh Valleys actually partly because they're a really nice place. You know, I have a lot of, I have a lot of family there, so I know them reasonably well. And we talk about them as a sort of story of economic decline, but you can go and, you know, you can be in the mountains in, you know, 30 minutes and on the coast in another 30 minutes, and they're, you know, really sort of lovely place. Um, and you make this point that actually, and I think this is important, is that much of what we are researching, well, certainly my own research on innovation, and I made this point in the, um, I've made this point in other sessions, my own research is sometimes a little bit naive in that I focus on, you know, business innovations and I focus on pa patents. And in doing so, I completely ignore some of the most important, you know, or the, the most important aspects of innovation. And actually, where the inclusive innovation agenda is best is when it's thinking about that sort of, you know, public sector type, you know, what you can do which is better for disadvantaged groups. So I, you know, I stand corrected. I think it's a useful corrective. I saw you in the audience, and I thought, I've got to be careful in that bit. <laughs> and I was too busy, I was too upset about Brexit, and I forgot. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Neil. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, I think this follows on from Maria's question and also from the discussion you just had with Kevin. So you were talking a little bit about kind of access to a kind of high-tech R&D type jobs there, access to STEM, etc. But you also kind of, in your chart, you, you talk about diffusion, you emphasized diffusion earlier on. Um, it's something that's been mentioned a few times in the conference, of course, the last few days, but kind of improving the quality of of work, of jobs in the, the broader economy. You know, there's plenty of jobs in the UK economy, uh, there's plenty of people working, but the quality of that work, and you mentioned it yourself, isn't always there. So, I mean, improving the quality of work in the service economy, in the foundational economy, uh, could potentially be the, the other side of the coin of improving productivity. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the diffusion and adoption of, of, of new ways of doing things. So. I just wonder what you thought about that and what you thought the prospects for that are for at the local level. What can local authorities, local actors, local policymakers do about that? So that's a great question because I've just finished a report for the Welsh Government on it. Oh, actually, we did, a, we did a long project for the Welsh Government on exactly these type of, um, yeah, what you can do to increase productivity in low-wage industries. So, sorry, for those of you who aren't interested in the UK, well, first of all, sorry. Um, <laughs> But second of all, so we, have a, we don't have an employment rate problem, we have a, a sort of crap jobs problem, you know, where there's a lot of not so good jobs at the lower end of the labor market. Um, and a lot of these are in sectors um, such as care, or, you know, which are not going anywhere, and which we found it very hard to increase productivity in. And that problem's not going away. And actually a lot of, you know, the inclusive innovation stuff, the way that the sort of concept has morphed, has been to focus on innovation in these types of sectors. And there are some good stories. There's some good stories of, of you know, new types of job design or new forms of you know, cooperatives in the care sector. 
Um, so I think that's actually one of the sort of areas I would probably push on. And part of the reason here is that there is actually quite a lot of you can do locally, and there's quite a lot you can do, certainly in the sort of devolved administrations. One of the nice things about this agenda, actually, you can see that Scotland have been quite keen on it, and Wales have been quite keen on it. England, you know, I'm English. Um, we've not been quite so good. Thank you. Once again, that... So there's a, there's a precedent for him, and this is not a surprise anymore. There's this sort of Norwegian uh, innovation, the uh, cheese slicer. And as a geographer, I, I, I think you appreciate some contextual details. It's from invented 1925, and that explains why the uh, slices, it slices is very, very thin. Because <laughs> Norway was very poor at that time, so the cheese should last as long as possible. It's perfect for brown cheese. Yeah. Not use it on soft cheese. Yeah. That is a mess. Thank, Thank you, very you very much. much. It's literally an inclusive innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>